Happy Election Day, everyone. It's Jen O'Malley Dillon. So glad to be here with all of you and appreciate you joining us today. So as we have talked about over the course of yesterday and, and much of this election, we wanted to make sure that we are doing all we can to be transparent about what we're seeing and hearing. And so uh, Bob Bauer and I are really looking forward to sharing with you our thoughts as we come into Election Day uh, and also uh, give you a little bit more insight in how we think we are positioned and positioned well coming through early vote. So as many of you know, we have seen record enthusiasm for turnout across this country, especially for Democrats. We think roughly 100 million people have voted early, most of them for Vice President Biden and Senator Harris. We saw, in fact, early vote pick up as we uh, headed to the final days of our early vote window. In North Carolina, we saw a 20 percent increase in voters under 30 casting their ballots during, during the final few days of early voting. In Georgia, we saw a 67 percent increase in African-American turnout in the final three days of early vote in person. We expect that enthusiasm coming through early vote to continue today, and we're already seeing it this morning across the country as people are voting voting uh, with minimal issues, with energy and enthusiasm carrying us through the morning. We also feel so well positioned because of the strong work of the campaign and our volunteers all across the country. Not only are people turning out to vote, they are also turning out in droves to volunteer. We have had over GOTV weekend more than 4 million conversations with voters. We've knocked on 1.3 million doors, sent over, thir unbelievably, 32 million texts. Um, and we have had more than 600,000 volunteer shifts. Just extraordinary scale uh, and representative of the enthusiasm and support that we're seeing across the board. So when we look to today, we feel like it is clear that we are winning. All the data that we're looking at really underscores how many pathways we believe we have to victory and how few Trump has. I'm going to walk through some of those pathways with all of you this morning. But I really want to be clear at the start that we are unfazed by Trump's a desperate attempts to hang on to this uh, election. We know and we have said from the beginning the American people are going to decide this election and that is no different today. We absolutely believe that. We know some of the results might take a bit longer um, to come in as we've talked about yesterday. We'll talk a little bit more about today, but we are confident on our path to victory. We are clear eyed and understanding what is going to come in when uh, and we also are confident that even if some of these states which we expect will take longer time to report that we're going to know tonight where the race is, and we're going to be uh, very clear from the data and the work that we've put together. So um, uh, we are very focused on our path to victory, and we are um, really clear that we have a number of pathways, and we start an election day coming in with a clear um, path to uh, 270. We think that we have a big lead. Um, the polling has shown that from the beginning, but we're obviously not just looking at polling, we're looking at early vote data. We believe the early vote data that we have been crunching every day since early votes started and that have put us in um, uh, our final uh, estimations this morning have us leading by eight points in our battleground states coming into election day. So while there's over 100 million people that have voted early across the country, 50 million of those in our battleground states and we come into election day with a plus eight point advantage. That allows us to continue to have these multiple paths to victory. As we've talked about, we have our protect states, uh, states we won in 8, 12, and 16 that we feel like we will have a strong showing in today, our win back, our swing states, which we'll dig in on, and our expansion states that we're incredibly uh, comfortable and excited for. So let me start by talking about the largest battleground states that are out there, Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, and Texas. These are the ones that have the largest electoral vote counts. Um, these are states that are always a big focus. And believe it or not, Texas is on this list this cycle, which um, you know really just shows uh, the enthusiasm for the vice president and Senator Harris. Um, we believe all three of these states are clearly in play. They have been across uh, the entire campaign and uh, places like Ohio and Texas coming on strong over the course of the last several uh, weeks uh, and months in the fall. 
Uh, if you look at these numbers, obviously, um, you know, we are seeing these as tight races. These are uh, tight states. We'd expect them to be because they are swing states. Um, and we, we obviously know that we believe we can win these, of course, because they're close. Trump could win them too. Um, in order for him to win them, however, he needs to do as well today it, and better uh, than he did on election day in 2016. And that is not um, something that anyone should take as a foregone conclusion and certainly not representative of what we've seen in the days leading up to today. So the truth is, as we look at these four big states, um, while we believe we can win all four of them and we, we uh, are doing everything in our power to do that, we don't need to win them. And that's a true luxury. We don't need to win any of these four big states in order to still get to 270 electoral votes. So I believe this campaign believes our protect and our safe states, they represent 232 electoral votes. So if we hold all of our protect states, which I believe we will, then we have so many paths to victory um, that allow us to get there even without these four states. And I think that's just fundamental as everyone is thinking about the day and thinking about the timing of the results. So let me dig in and walk through a couple of those potential pass with you now. Uh, as I said, and as we discussed yesterday, uh, we feel very good about our position in North Carolina, Georgia, and Wisconsin. Together, these three states represent 41 electoral votes. So if we win these three states and hold on to our protect states, we have won 273 electoral votes and Joe Biden will be president. If you look at this slide, you can see that Trump has to overperform his 2016 election day results in all three of these states in order to win. That's pretty significant. So as we talked about yesterday, we look at our early vote data, we look at our expected turnout, we look at uh, what we expect that will happen throughout the day, and we are able to have a very good estimation of what needs to happen and what number Trump has to achieve today to make up the gap he comes into election day with. And so for him to exceed and make up that gap, he's going to have to significantly outperform what he did in 2016. For example, in North Carolina, we would estimate that he would need to win 62% of the election day vote in order to win today. Uh, and in 2016, a state that he won, he had 56% of the vote on election day. So certainly not impossible, but definitely far more challenging. And as you look to each of these states, uh, Georgia, a state that has continued to come on incredibly strong over the course of the last several weeks, and we feel uh, very, very well positioned in all three of these states, Georgia and North Carolina will report earlier tonight. So uh, we are very focused on uh, getting those numbers, but we also feel like we are very well positioned. As we get to our next pathway to talk through, um, that pathway includes uh, states, Arizona, Michigan, and North Carolina. So our first pathway, the one I just walked through with you, it assumes we win Georgia and it assumes we win North Carolina, but we don't need to win both of those in order to be uh, get to our path to 270. Another path to get there includes Arizona, Michigan, and North Carolina, and they account for 42 electoral votes. Again, this is a situation for Donald Trump where he needs to overperform his 2016 election day in order to win in, in these states. And that is a significant um, task for him today. Um, in Michigan, for example, he needs to win 62% of the vote on election day, so on today, um, of, of folks coming in today. And that would be overperforming his 2016 vote by more than 10 points. So that is a significant amount of work that would have to be done tonight. As we look at these states, uh, obviously, again, um, there's a lot of different permutations on how they could come through, but this just gives you a sense of how we're analyzing everything, the really sharp focus we have on the data available to us, our understanding about how that works uh, in terms of the timing, um, and really fundamentally uh, allowing us to show that we are positioned uh, in, in a strong place. 
So in summary, um, I think the biggest takeaway that, that I have for you is that we continue to have these multiple pathways to 270 electoral votes. And I wanted to just show this one additional way to take a look at this. As you know, we believe that Pennsylvania uh, is a place where we're far ahead. We feel very good about turnout already that we're seeing all across the state today. Um, and uh, it is a state that has outsized importance in many ways, Florida as well. Um, but we can win 270 electoral votes even without Pennsylvania and Florida. So I think that that is something that um, really helps put into sharp relief what Trump has to accomplish today and what where we're positioned. So if we were with, if we included um, Pennsylvania and Florida, that would take us to 335 electoral votes. That includes the, the lean states, the protect states I had talked about. But without Pennsylvania, and we won a Florida or North Carolina or Arizona, in addition to Michigan and Wisconsin, which again, Donald Trump would have to do as much as 10 points or more better than he did in 2016, we'd still get to around 315 electoral votes. And then finally, without Pennsylvania and Florida, we still cross that 270 threshold with Arizona or North Carolina, Michigan, Wisconsin, and our, our uh, protect state. So very strong position. Our goal is to keep pushing in all of these states. We feel so confident about, about the pathway we have. We also are very cognizant of the timing of the results. And we know while not all of these states uh, will be reported out tonight, uh, we will have a very firm and clear sense of what our uh, path is, our exact numbers and expectations of that. And just a reminder as we come into this evening, even though Pennsylvania have outsized importance, they are requirements for Donald Trump to get to 270. They are not requirements for Joe Biden to get to 270 because his math and his map has so many pathways. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Bob Bauer to talk about what we're seeing this morning, how we're positioned in terms of the election administration and integrity uh, moving into these final hours today. Thank you, Jen. And let me just make some preliminary uh, comments here about what we're seeing overall. The, the polls are opening well this morning, minimal issues and disruptions, and the issues that arise are being addressed. I'm going to give you a little bit more detail here. By and large, uh, voting is proceeding smoothly. Uh, a few sites in states like North Carolina, Arizona, and Florida have had some delays. Almost all are now up and running. And when we're talking about delays, let me be very clear. In some of these circumstances, the delays are you know, 10 to 15 minutes. In at least one case, owing to some issues with electronic poll books, uh, the delay ran up to uh, 40 to 60 minutes, but eventually the problem was resolved uh, and voting uh, proceeded. It, voters are lined up before the polls in places like uh, Michigan, Ramsey and Hennepin counties in Minnesota, Franklin and Cuyahoga counties in Ohio. And so that's going to account for the longer lines. It's enthusiasm. And there are turnout related lines in Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Miami, and many others. And I will be discussing momentarily I'll be discussing momentarily the ways in which Trump's rhetoric of uh, chaos uh, just simply doesn't undermine the clear appearance that we have an election day in which election officials are operating very effectively uh, to run the kind of election that uh, we believe voters are entitled to and that we're working very hard with election administrators uh, to bring off. So all in all, a very, very strong opening to election day and matters proceeding really quite well and hats off again to the election administration officials who are doing this. I would also like to provide uh, some background here on just exactly how well uh, voters are doing here as their ballots are being received and processed. As we said yesterday, the rejection rates of ballots are falling well below what many believe would be the case uh, just a few months ago. So in Florida, for example, the rejection rate now is about three tenths of one percent. In Wisconsin, as of November 1st, the rejection rate is uh, approximately, you know, 0.11%. And in North Carolina, the rejection rate is six tenths of 1%. And more than 7,000 North Carolinians uh, have, because there were issues with their ballots, been able, under the legal processes available to them, with the help of our campaign, with the help of election officials, to cure those ballots. And so this is an example, metrics that can demonstrate very clearly how, in fact, this works. Now, yesterday, we also said something about. Um, 
the way the Republicans have been responding to this election. Their view all along is that it was going to be chaotic, it wasn't going to run well, there was going to be massive irregularities, there was going to be fraud, and of course, none of that actually has occurred. Uh, and furthermore, uh, their efforts, which do receive, uh, in my view, increasingly disproportionate press attention to bring legal actions in various states, have met with only frustration. Uh, we've had recent positive decisions uh, on cases in Pennsylvania, Texas, and Nevada. In Pennsylvania, very good example of where the Trump campaign tried very hard to make a strong case of widespread fraud. They brought in all of their best evidence and the court threw it out on summary judgment. Even those uh, who are not familiar with the legal term uh, understand what summary judgment means, which is that the case fell so completely short uh, that a full trial on the merits was not required. Now we know about Texas and the 127,000 ballots that were in question. Um, through the drive-by sites, and we're, the slides are catching up with me, but I'm going to keep on going, uh, through the drive-by sites um, that were intended to provide protections for voters, and voters were relying on what election officials had told them to cast those ballots. And yesterday, um, the judge uh, made the decision that those 127,000 ballots ought to be maintained. That, that is to say, those ballots were valid and they would be counted. I should mention to you that Republicans, you know, never say die in their vote suppression efforts, went immediately to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals immediately de denied what the Republicans claimed was their requirement of emergency relief. They're not getting the relief they're seeking. They're not getting the invalidation of those ballots. Uh, in Nevada, uh, the Trump campaign was complaining about the observation process in Clark County, yet again, very quickly, a court threw that out. Now, today you may be hearing about a lawsuit in Pennsylvania, in Montgomery County. There are rumors of other suits of the kind that are attempts uh, to suggest that there are irregularities taking place in the implementation of uh, the election in those counties. And there are all sorts of efforts uh, to complain about this or that um, problem at some minute level of detail that they're detecting in the way the elections are run. In fact, what they're observing as election administrators trying to deliver an election to the voters, to eligible voters who want to be able to access the process and vote. They will be unsuccessful. I've read these lawsuits. Um, I'm not going to characterize um, uh, the, the work of um, brothers and sisters at the bar, but let's just say it's not going to work. Uh, the attempt of these lawyers to come in into the 11th hour with specious claims and hope to hook the courts on them, I think is doomed to failure. But we will could see some more of those suits today. Again, nothing uh, that any people familiar with election law would take particularly seriously. And I will also point out, because it was an important consideration for the judge in Texas, that lawsuits that are brought in the 11th hour like this for evidently disruptive purposes, even setting apart the weakness of the legal claims, are not going to be viewed favorably by the courts. And the courts recognize this sort of last minute hijinks uh, for what it is. So the lawsuit in Pennsylvania and any others like it uh, is frivolous. It's designed, by the way, primarily to get attention, potentially to arouse concern in the voters. And so like yesterday, I'd like to make the appeal uh, that the press take a very long, skeptical look at what these lawsuits are really about. They're designed to generate the appearance of a cloud over the election. They are, in fact, not bona fide legal claims against voters. And they are being basically filed against voters, so they're styled frequently as claims against election officials. But they have no merit, and they do not deserve the press attention that they're generating. We'd be very glad, uh, of course, to answer any questions you have about these lawsuits. But one way or the other, once they're noted, uh, we hope there'll be a lot of attention to the underlying weakness and the certain failure of these attempts uh, to raise these questions about the election. And so we're feeling at this point uh, very good about the way the election's running. We're feeling very comfortable uh, with what we think is the patently failing and in many respects, you know, just how to characterize it, uh, meritless, uh, meritless efforts of the Republicans to raise uh, claims about the election. And we're not even seeing an awful lot of this that would uh, prevent us from seeing most clearly what is most striking today. Polling places open, election officials driving a process that is a fair and inclusive process and affording our voters their constitutional right to vote. And so with that, uh, Jen, I'll conclude. So much.
much, Bob, and thanks, everyone. I know we're happy to take a few questions. Most important thing for us to say is people need to keep voting. And anyone that's out there, if you haven't voted, go vote. If you have questions, I will vote.com. Don't leave one person in your life without outreach to today. We need everyone, and we believe the most powerful thing that we can do is just have a resounding, extraordinary turnout in support for the Vice President and Senator Harris to take back uh, our country and lead us forward. So thank you all, and we will happy to take questions. Hi there. Uh, this is Nicole Killian from CBS News. Uh, thanks so much for doing the call. Um, two quick questions for you. As far as the former vice president's address to the nation this evening, what will his message be? And secondly, you focused a lot in your presentation on the percentage of turnout that Donald Trump needs. Uh, but what about for your campaign? What do you feel is the percentage you need in some of these key states in order to be victorious? Thank you. Thanks, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I think you're gonna hear the vice president speak as he has every single day of this campaign uh, about leading this country forward, uh, about unifying this country, um, that he has the vision and the plan to come together and lead us through these multiple crises that we're facing, uh, and that together we can be led forward, that there is a plan that he has uh, and a pathway for us to get through um, where we are in this country together. Um, from the very, very beginning of this campaign, the reason he got into this race was talking about the soul of this nation. Uh, he's still talking about that today, a battle for the soul of this nation that we believe we will win tonight. And I believe you're going to hear the vice president speak to that uh, further. You know, in terms of where we need to be, as I said um, at the start, as we looked at not just the polling, but the early vote data, we come into election day in our battleground states ahead by eight points. Obviously, in each state, it's different. Um, some of these states are, are tighter. Florida is a, is a coin toss, without a doubt. Uh, our Midwestern states, um, we are ahead significantly by 10 points or more coming into Election Day. And so we know that we are um, very strong coming out of early vote. Um, we are going to continue to see, see very strong vote, uh, especially in places like Pennsylvania that we expect about 60% of voters to vote today. Uh, and that means that um, we're going to see a larger turnout, whereas in a number of states will have, you know, already hit 60, 70, maybe even 80 percent in some states of overall turnout. We do believe turnout is going to be very significant. We have anticipated higher turnout all along. Uh, we think it could be, um, you know, somewhere in the 150 to the 160 range, probably in the higher end of that range based on early vote turnout and what we're seeing today. Uh, and because of that, we feel state to state in our battleground states, we're very well positioned to continue on the track and the trajectory we're headed, but we don't actually need to maintain that same trajectory because we are coming in with such an advantage. And that's why Trump has such a harder uh, hill to climb today to overcome the advantage we came into today with. Hey, this is Molly Nagel from ABC. Uh, two quick questions for you. First, uh, you guys are presenting a very positive outlook on tonight's election. Have you connected with the Trump campaign um, about the logistics of setting up a concession call should one be needed by either candidate uh, tonight? And could you just provide a little bit more clarity in terms of um, what you guys would need to see that might trigger you to um, declare victory tonight specifically? So, uh, you know, on the first, we're obviously focused on running through the tape, as the vice president would say, uh, and, uh, you know, we'll let the logistics play out uh, as they go here. But, you know, we are communicating to all of our states and our programs, our volunteers and our voters, uh, you know, over the course of the day and, and really prioritizing that communication. You know, I think that as we've talked about, we talked about more in depth yesterday, we know the timing of voting uh, this evening. So our expectation is certainly, um, on the earlier side, there'll be a number of states, you know, Indiana and Kentucky, Virginia, that will be very early uh, and calling, and, and we'll be taking a look at what those states uh, mean in terms of our projections. But the significant battleground states uh, will come in, um, you know, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, we expect to be on the earlier side. Those three states, we do not need to win to get to 270, uh, but we think we are very well positioned in all three of them. Uh, we think that we come into election day ahead 
ahead in both, uh, significantly ahead in both North Carolina and Georgia, and a dead heat uh, a couple points ahead in Florida. Um, and so on those states that traditionally go earlier, I think they're going to tell us a lot about the night. But then, uh, obviously, as we've we've talked about, um, we're going to have vote that's coming in, you know, as the, as the night goes forward with um, West Coast states, Arizona in particular, uh, while we expect Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, for instance, very strong states for us to uh, take a little bit longer to count. We do know we will get a substantial portion of the vote that will come in on election night. So we uh, are going to be making sure and looking at uh, the data that's coming in, that it's matching our projections, uh, that the turnout's matching our projections, that we have a very good hand on uh, what uh, the day itself looks like to add on top of the early vote. And then we're going to be making our assessment based on that. And we feel pretty confident as we look to the states that come in early, even if we are outstanding in some of our states like a Wisconsin where, you know, as we said, Trump has to overperform what he did in 2016. Um, we believe in those places where we have a larger uh, um, um, advantage um, and we are not within the margin of error in the numbers we're looking at that that gives us the ability to make some projections uh, earlier, uh, even if we don't have the full vote out. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Again, we, we commit to keep working through all of this with all of you and being transparent about what we're seeing um, to make sure that you have the benefit of what we're looking at and how we're approaching it. Jen, it's Kristen Welker. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Can you characterize the vice president's mood today? Obviously, he visited his childhood home. He was in Scranton. He seemed a bit nostalgic. Um, and can you also speak to some of his supporters who say he's been so aggressive out on the campaign trail in these final days? And they do have some concerns that he hasn't been in the weeks leading up to the election. Are you confident that you've left everything on the field? So the vice president is off to a great day and a great start. I think he closed last night. We had barnstorming all across Pennsylvania, just a wonderful event um, that we had hundreds of thousands of people tuning in to watch um, last evening. And today, as you mentioned, um, spending time in Scranton. He's on the road with his um, his grandchildren and is confident, uh, but is keeping uh, moving forward and making sure that he is out there getting our, our word out. We have uh, Senator Harris. Uh, in Detroit. We have Dr. Biden in Florida and in uh, North Carolina today. We have Doug Emhoff in Ohio. So we are not uh, wasting one moment. We are going up to the wire, making sure that everyone in this country knows how important their vote is to the vice president and that he's doing everything he can to earn this this vote. And I, I uh, feel so confident. I know the vice president does that we have done everything, um, you know, that this campaign has set out to do to reach voters. Uh, to do that, however, in a safe way, to do that in a way that puts does not put people in harm's way, um, that ensures that we are able to travel safely, um, but as importantly, engage people and have meaningful conversations. When we talk about what the campaign's done, we talk about the conversations, the millions of conversations we've had, um, because we're focused on that quality engagement. And that's really reflected in the travel uh, as we have crisscrossed the 17 battleground states that we have carried into election day. So we believe that we are gonna end tonight having left every single ounce uh, on the field because of the enthusiasm and the hard work of our volunteers all across this country. Hey, it's Katie Glick. Thank you all so much for doing this. Uh, to follow up on Molly's question, just to press a little further on that. So do you expect that Biden will declare victory tonight? And can you tell us a little bit more about the factors that you'd need to see before he makes that announcement for sure? So the vice president, is, uh, our expectation is he's going to address uh, the American people tonight. Uh, and that's what we're focused on. But we're also focused on making sure that we are pushing uh, through to Election Day until every single poll is closing. Um, you're going to have, as I said, they're traveling all across the country. Uh, you have our, our campaign and our surrogates and hitting local media markets all across the country. We're going to continue to do that as polls close. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue to monitor uh, as polls close, uh, you know, the, the early results. We have a very good sense of not just the timing of when uh, we'll be reporting uh, and, and numbers will be coming in, but the order of it. We know, uh, as we talked a bit about 
Previously, in some states, you know, we might have someone, some local municipality saying that they're 100 percent reported, but we know they haven't accounted for mail-in ballots. Or we know in places like um, uh, Michigan that they're counting in a, a one central location and then they disperse out. So we feel like we have a very good understanding of when the vote's coming in, how it's coming in, and also our expectations of, of what we hope to see. And so we're going to be looking at that and monitoring it closely. So I think that that is um, our last question, but I appreciate all of you. Uh, I know you're out there working hard uh, today in this final stretch as well. Uh, as we mentioned, we're gonna come back uh, as we can throughout the day and keep uh, everyone updated. And if you have questions, uh, always feel free to reach out to our press team and, and we'll make sure to get back in touch with you quickly. Thanks so much, everyone.